I love the community aspect. Um, I can get in touch with my collectors directly. There's no like gatekeeping kind of like you see in a gallery where usually the gallerist will kind of want to separate you from the collector. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Jen Stark. If you don't know who Jen is, she is a visual artist. Her work is inspired by designs in nature. She's most known for her Vortex collection on art blocks. Jen, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm super excited to have met you at VCon, and I'm really excited today to explore art and NFTs along with your wisdom for creators. Um, But before we go there, I would love to hear a little bit of your backstory. How'd you get into art? How'd you eventually get into NFTs? Start wherever you want to start. Yeah, I got into art from a very early age. I grew up in Miami, Florida, and my grandpa was a hobby artist. He would do watercolor paintings of, you know, Miami scenes, water birds, sailboats, um, stuff like that. So I was inspired by him early on and then kind of just, you know, went into art classes, decided to go to art college and decided to make the leap to become a professional artist. And I, in college, I was a sculptor mostly. I did paintings, but I also minored in animation. So that kind of, you know, started prepping me on the digital art uh, journey. And I've made, you know, many animations in my past since I graduated. And then eventually I heard of NFTs and it was just felt like the perfect platform for it. Let me ask a couple questions on the animation front. What kind of animation were you doing? And then also, how was it before you found NFTs as an artist? Was this, talk about if there was any struggle or if it was really easy. I'm just curious what it was like to have a career as an artist prior to NFTs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I started making animations that were inspired by stop motion and kind of more sculptural. I I was really into cutting paper and making these like crazy vortex tunnel sculptures. And I loved the step-by-step, just like very meditative quality that stop motion can bring. It's just like, you know, layer by layer, you have to take a photo, move it, take a photo, move it. So I loved that about it. It kind of sent me into this meditative state and started my animation journey there and eventually got into more digital work, um, you know, using more computer-based animation, a little less analog. And yeah, being a visual artist before NFTs, um, luckily I was, um, you know, pretty successful in supporting myself early on and selling paintings and sculptures in gallery shows and through collectors. Um, But it was always really difficult to sell my animations or digital work. It was kind of more for the love of it that I that I did it and it was really hard you know ask any digital digital artist very hard to sell those before nfts so that that was amazing when you know nft nfts really hit the scene in full force um for me it was early 2021 and that really changed the game so tell us a little bit about that journey into NFTs. It was early 2021. How'd you find out about it? What'd you do? Tell us a little bit of that story. Yeah. So I I started, you know, hearing rumblings about these three letters NFT. And I'm like, what 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 is an NFT? Like I I I had no idea. Um, I jumped into Clubhouse, thankfully, you know, this was kind of mid-pandemic. Um, nobody was really hanging out that much. So it was all v- very virtual. So we would jump into Clubhouse um, during the day or at night and just like learn from each other and talk to each other and ask questions. And it was kind of just this community on Clubhouse informing me on what NFTs were and like guiding us to like how to create them and um, the proper platforms to do it on. So um, I decided to mint my first one in March of late March 2021. And I did it on foundation, which was kind of for me, the gallery standard of um, NFT platforms at the time. So 
I, I minted one of my favorites, Multiverse, and it it did very well. It The sales exceeded expectations, and it was a really mind-blowing moment. Tell, tell us a little bit about what the expectations were and what happened with the sale. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I minted it. I had a few people bid it, bidding on it at the auction, and that was awesome. I think it was up to like $10,000, and then... This was a 24 hour clock, so it was up to about 10,000. And I went to bed that night and I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And there's still like 12 more hours. That's that's crazy. Um, so wait, just so we understand the mechanics, was this a bid on just one piece of art? Like explain a little bit about that. Yes, so it was a one of one, um, a digital animation that was about, I think 45 seconds long, it was a loop. And, and yeah, there's, the way that foundation did it was you have multiple bidders so they you can see the history and you you just you know have to keep bidding higher if you want to beat out the last bidder and it was on a 24 hour clock so i think i started at noon one day and then uh ended at noon the next and yeah went to bed that night i was so stoked that it was up to 10,000 for a digital asset that is you know I had never known that before. Um, and then I had a dream that it that it sold for over a hundred ETH. And I woke up and I'm like, damn, Jen, why why are you trying to, you know, disappoint yourself? Or uh, you know, I I thought my brain was playing tricks with me, and I'm like, okay, that's weird. I'm not gonna think about that. And then um eventually during the auction, we had bidders jumping in and um, it was Jabulon, 3F Music, Mondo, Mondoir. Um, they were, you know, just bidding with each other. And eventually the sales, it reached um, 150, which was what? insane. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Just so everybody understands, like translate that into dollars. Like how much money was that back then? So back then it was almost, uh, it was almost half a million. What was your reaction? Um, I, I mean, my mind was blown. I was also like in a clubhouse, just like cheering with people. We were, we like got a bottle of champagne. I feel like my mind was about to explode. Like I, I couldn't comprehend it. And I felt, you know, so grateful. It was, it was an amazing day. I'll, I'll never forget it. Okay, so you sell what has to be one of the most expensive pieces of art back then, right? I mean, like, that's crazy for a mint, right? So then take us through the rest of the journey up to the present, like, you know, um, and I know we're going to get into maybe a little bit of it as we go throughout the interview, but you you hit it out of the park with your very first one, and it must have changed everything for you, right? So, like, what happened after that? Yeah, that was amazing, and it, it also broke records for uh, foundations, like female artists that was you know, the top 10 selling NFTs were all men. And I broke into that top 10, which was felt really awesome. amazing. Break that glass ceiling. Um, yeah. And then after that, we just decided to drop a few other one of ones. I dropped on super rare next. Um, and then back to foundation. And then after that, I, I had this experiential show in New York City two years ago, like summer 2021. And I decided to make an uh, NFT collection based off one of the rooms of that. So collectors, I think there were 60 pieces in the collection and collectors could technically own a piece, a small piece of the room. So that was that was really exciting. It was like a, I think a four or five week auction. It, it was a long kind of slow roll. So, so how many different NFTs have you minted now as of we're recording this in the summer of 2023? Yeah. Um, I've, I mean, if you count them all, count them all, like at least a couple thousand, because um, I also did the art blocks collection vortex. That was a thousand NFTs. Um, so yeah, I would say a couple thousand. Wow. And for the art blocks one, was each one different or were they all the same? I'm just curious. Yeah. So art blocks, it's, you know, it's all generative and they're all one of one. So I see. When, got it. when people mint them, then it appears and you, you see what you got. Like even I, as the creator, didn't know 
what the collection would look like exactly. So that's like the beauty of art blocks. Very cool. All right. Well, first of all, absolutely phenomenal story. Um, I'm sure a lot of people listening right now, their minds are blown, you know, um, there's a lot of creators potentially listening to this interview now and in the future. And, um, why should they consider NFTs? What do you want to say to them? Um, maybe they're just not quite sold on it, right? Maybe they've heard your story. They're inspired by your story, but they're just not sure as to why they ought to consider, uh, doing NFTs. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, for me, NFTs, there, there's a lot of benefits, like um, just having provenance with your artwork on the blockchain is really, really amazing. As like a physical artist, I, you know, I sell a painting, it'll ship overseas or it'll ship here and there, and I can't keep track of it. It's like impossible. I don't know if pieces are destroyed or if they're lost or if where they are. And I think that's the beauty of NFTs in the blockchain that you they're always connected to your wallet and it's like they're certifiable they're you know they they're just attached to you forever and i i love that about it i love the community aspect um i can get in touch with my collectors directly there's no like gatekeeping kind of like you see in a gallery where usually the gallerists will kind of want to separate you from the collector um so i i love that about it just like the community meeting my collectors and having, you know, a friendship with them. <laughs> What's your thoughts on it as a business model? Um, I think, I think it can be very um, lucrative for artists. And I mean, I, I, I've, I've loved, you know, this whole journey. It's like, it's really enabled me to support myself and, you know, hire more employees and stuff like that. Um, I think as a business model, it's, yeah. I mean, artists tend to not, sometimes it's, it's unfamiliar to them, but I've, I've really embraced it. And I think it could be a really, really awesome option to, you know, support yourself. Very cool. Well, first of all, great story, super excited about um, digging in a little bit. Um, so let's talk about, you know, you've done a lot of NFTs, right? And you, even though you've been in it for slightly more than two years, that's considered really old. You're like an OG in the world of, <laughs> of Web3, right? Even though I know everybody, like there's very few people that have been in this for much longer than two years, right? So um, what have you learned um, about NFTs uh, throughout your journey? What kind of wisdom can you impart to others maybe who are thinking about getting in? Yeah, I would say, I mean, early on, I I knew the blockchain was permanent. Everything you mint and put out there is kind of, you know, it's traceable. It's like, so I guess I would say to just think holistically about what you're going to put out there and um, really be, try not to put too much stuff out there and flood your market. Like I, I, I like to try to be very intentional and considerate about how much work I put out there as not to like, you know, flood the market or raise the price too much or lower the price too much that way. But yeah, I would say just be intentional and think about things holistically. And if you want projects to like interact with each other or have like weird Easter eggs, I think it's important for artists to like plan out their steps so that it's done in a thoughtful way. Talk to me about, the weird Easter eggs thing, just because I think people are like, Oh, tell me more about that. Yeah. I mean, like, let's see, I don't know. Fuck render. He did Lucida. So he, he created this whole universe that he's just like slowly unveiling through his NFTs. And it's not just like this one-off project that doesn't really make sense. Like everything he drops kind of makes sense with each other. And, you know, a lot of artists are doing that kind of thing, um, which I think is really cool. So when you think about holistically, when you talk about thinking about things holistically, I think what I'm hearing you say is you've got to kind of think beyond the first project, right? But yeah. a lot of people might say, I don't even want to think about the beyond the first project because the first project might not work. So how do you, how do you wrestle with that? You know what I mean? What's your, what's your wisdom on that? That's true. Um, I mean, as an artist, 
it's it's true that you need to like make mistakes and if you don't take the first step then you can't like you're never going to go anywhere so i guess don't let that that paralyze you into not making the first step but you know i've the the nft artists i've seen succeed have been very very thoughtful and not putting too many projects out there and um you know thinking about the future and like longevity of their projects so that's yeah talk to me about like the people what kind of insights you have about working with different people because generally speaking at least today it's not super simple to do this completely on your own right i mean there are tools like manifold that allow that to happen and we've had richard chan on the show but like sometimes you got to work with people and what have you learned about working with people to get these projects from your mind ultimately to fruition yeah i mean with everything i do i try to try to work with people that i really vibe with and people that have good energy good intentions um you know that are not trying to undercut you or um yeah that's that's kind of my my how do you, how do you even know this like but because you think about from a fellow artist who's not in the space yet right and they don't know what they don't know, right? How do they not, yeah. how, how do they know that they're getting a good vibe from somebody, you know, and not just getting sold a bill of goods? Yeah. I mean, sometimes you don't, it's really like experience and going with your gut. And, you know, I've worked with people that I've regretted later, but I just keep moving and I try to make more informed decisions as I go. And, yeah. Also vet people, you know, like you, you can like ask around if you're thinking of working with someone, ask, ask people like, what was your experience with them? Are they, you know, a good person? <laughs> so what, what kind of people are you typically working with these days? Is it developers? Is it marketers? Like what kind of people? Mainly artists, like artists that I um, am inspired by, or they have like a similar aesthetic to my work and can help me you know, better execute my vision. Um, some developers too, but yeah, just people that I'm inspired by. So let's talk about, um, you, you've done a whole bunch of different projects, right? And I would love to kind of break down a little bit about, like we heard the story about the very first one, right? Which was this auction for 24 hours. Um, how did you approach your um, strategy? Because if you're telling people to be holistic and thoughtful about it, then I think it's implied that you've tried very hard to be holistic and thoughtful about how you do what you do by not releasing too many and so on and so forth. So let's talk about like your, um, your, your, your different approach to the various collections you're doing from either, uh, um, uh, function or design or collection size, pricing, all that kind of fun stuff. Let's dig a little deep into maybe comparing these various different approaches that you've taken. Yeah. Um, it also depends on the market. Like uh, two years ago, one of ones are, were really just really popular and it felt like the right moment to do that. Now we have, we see open editions a lot and that's, those have been popping. So it's also kind of what's in the moment, but also I, I like to try to one up myself every time I put out a new project. Um, like the last one that I did was called Digital Paint, and it was um, a bespoke website that the collector could go to and kind of paint their own image in my my artwork style, and then you could mint it on the blockchain. And that that had secret coding Easter eggs in it, which will reveal itself throughout the year. It had a sound element, so it's like sound interactive. And on OpenSea, you can go to people's NFTs and actually play with them and draw on them. Um, so yeah, I try to I try to like one up myself every time I do a new project and try to utilize the technology as best I can. So, so let's talk the the one you're talking about right now. Um, what's the name of that project again? The one that digital paint. Yeah. So how many digital paints are there in the collection and it, what's the mint price? I'm just curious about the mechanics, the business side of it. Right. And then maybe we can go back and talk about what you did in the prior collection and just kind of, so people can wrap their heads around this. 
Yeah. So that one, there was 5000 in the collection, and I'm going to forget the mint price, but it was, I think it was like point three or something. Point um, three. Okay. Yeah. But that, yeah, that, that was really fun. And I love like the interactive element of it and, you know, just getting people excited about creating their own NFTs. And then the one before that? That was Vortex Collection. And I think the mint price, Artblocks does it a bit differently where um, it's, it's a pretty short auction um, typically. And that mint price, I think it minted out at like 0.75. Oh, wow. Okay. That's pretty expensive. So um, and there was a thousand of them, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So um, after doing the uh, Vortex 1000 and, and what, was there any unique functionality on that one that was different than digital paint? As far as you tell the way it worked? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say the, the uniqueness was it's, it's kind of sculptural, the Vortex collection. So you can you can pull them and like move them around and see that they have three dimensionality. And um, the Vortex collection is based off my earlier paper sculptures that I, you know, kind of started my career with. So I, I see it as like a like a very signature style of mine. And yeah, it's, I love that collection. So doing the um, 1,000 on the Vortex and then the you said it was 5,000 on digital paint. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And the digital paint was less. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what was, this, what was the thinking behind that uh, doing more versus less and any thoughts on whether you would do it differently with the next one? Yeah. Um, it, I, you know, my, <laughs> my, yeah. yeah, it's, it's kind of based on the market and kind of, where the price of Ethereum is and what the general temperature is. Um, but yeah, lately a lot of artists have been dropping like bigger volume, smaller price collections. So I, you know, wanted to try that out, but I still love doing one of ones and, you know, very special, special things like that. So, yeah. Let's talk about, um, how many do you have any sense of how big the community is of all the owners of all the NFTs combined? Because I'm sure you have some people buying multiples, right? Are we talking 1,000, 3,000? Do you have any sense of how many total individuals there might be inside your Gen Star ecosystem? Yeah, I would say, hmm, I think the Vortex collection is like 60% unique holders. So, uh, I don't know, anywhere from like 500 collectors to maybe a thousand. So you've got these 500 to a thousand people and um, that are collecting your, your work. And do you find that people that buy one of your pieces tend to buy another one of your pieces? So how do yeah. you actually, how do you actually, what have you learned about cultivating that community of collectors? Cause as you mentioned earlier, you said with a gallery, typically you don't have that connection, right? You're, you got that middle person in the middle that's um, keeping you at arm's length from who is the owner, right? That pot thing. So with this community, how are you um, cultivating the community and what are you doing to maybe encourage them to be active and maybe get into your next collection? Yeah. Um, well, I started the Discord server. That's really helpful. A lot of artists do that. Um, and kind of create different channels for the different collections that you have. And you can talk one-on-one -on -one with your collectors there. Um, I also, you know, incent uh, incentivize and kind of like, if you're holding some of my prior NFTs, you get like a, a discounted price on a future mint. So mm -hmm. the digital paint mint for um, previous collectors, I think it was 0.1. So we'll... I'll do things like that, that, um, you know, as like an added, added bonus for collectors. And I've done like giveaways of physical objects, like prints or merch, um, stuff like that for holders, airdrops. So yeah, just try to try to keep everybody happy and, you know, not everybody's going to be happy, but I try to, I try to just put the best art out there and keep my intentions pure. 
How is this for you as an artist who maybe isn't used to interacting with the owners, you know, did it require any kind of mindset shifts or any kind of changes in your thinking? Um, it, it definitely opened up a lot of new friendships and new, you know, new connections. I've met so many people through it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been amazing. I've, that's one of my favorite parts of it. I've met so many new people, like collectors of my work that I've become friends with and I, you know, see them at IRL. It's, it's been really amazing. When it comes to this community of uh, 500 to a thousand people, um, is there any expectation expectation? Cause I'm sure a lot of other people that are thinking about getting in here wondering like what demand do they have on, would they have on my time? Like, are you expected to show up in there every day and answer their questions? Are you expected to have monthly kind of gatherings? I, you know, any tips on that? Because I can imagine if I'm used to creating something and then just letting someone else handle it. And I just want to focus on the creative and not focus on the engagement side of it. It might be, I don't know, a new experience, right? So yeah. anything you've done or anything you recommend? Yeah. Um, that is a tricky kind of like new layer of this world because in my fine art career in the past, I didn't have to do any of that really. Um, so now it's like kind of a new layer of interaction, which is a plus and a minus because you have these new relationships, but you also have like a little bit less time creating your work. Um, and a lot of artists are not good at multitasking like that or don't want to. So <clears throat> yeah, I would recommend if you're not into that idea of just like, having having to set up a discord and do all these things like i guess don't promise too much utility with your artwork so that means don't you know promise a future roadmap or this and that because it's it's really hard to keep up with that kind of stuff if you're not motivated to it to do that um and yeah i mean i with my nfts i i don't expressly say there's utility but um you know, I do see it as uh, like fine artwork, as an investment. Um, but yeah, it's kind of just to take the pressure off me so I can focus on the art and creating. How do you actually communicate with your community? Because Discord can be kind of a little unwieldy and sometimes people don't even look inside of Discord. Are yeah. you like collecting email addresses or and trying to send a newsletter or kind of what, how are you, how are you getting out there when you're ready to launch a new collection to that audience? Yeah, I usually use my social media platforms like Twitter is really great for crypto, crypto collectors and crypto artists. Um, Discord, I'll definitely use like to drop announcements and stuff like that. Um, I have for my more physical fine art practice, I'll do like a mailing list and, you know, send those out. But it's typically typically Twitter or Instagram. Let's talk a little bit about like um, from, you know, a business perspective, like is your strategy to try to launch like one collection a year or multiple collections a year? And I'm just kind of curious because obviously um, many people that are listening may not know this, but the royalty thing is getting harder, right? Obviously, I don't know if you're still earning royalties on your um on, on the on the purchases that are, people are making, but now that the platforms are making it optional, I'd imagine that's cutting in a little bit of your income, right? So as a result of this, have you had to change your strategy and how often do you plan on launching? Yeah, that that was a bummer that <laughs> the, the royalties kind of just disappearing on the platforms. Um, you know, it's, I think collectors sometimes see it as like paying a tax, but that's, that was like the beautiful thing to me about NFTs that um, the artist can get a royalty from every sale. And I, I loved that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, definitely cut my um, secondary uh, earnings that way. It's, it's unfortunate, but you know, it's, it's like an ever changing landscape and we just have to be, flexible and you know figure it out some artists are creating their own websites where the secondary only happens on that and it like ensures royalties so yeah people are trying to find ways to get around it and what about your um 
strategy for launching new projects? Do you do them whenever you feel inspired to do them or do you do them on a strategic basis? I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, a little bit of both. I try not to drop too many projects around the same period. I'll, I like to have breathing room between each one to, you know, help make people excited and also not not like flood my market. Um, but yeah, I tend to drop, I would say three to four projects a year. Wow. And you generally do recommend as a strategy to give an incentive to your existing holders to incentivize them to keep collecting. Is that, is that something you think you'll keep doing? For sure. Yeah. Either by airdrops, like free airdrops or, you know, a, a lower price on future mints. Um, yeah. I, I, I love like rewarding people that have supported me and that have believed in me. So I think that's a really important part of this whole community. Talk to me about the free airdrops. I know that that was a strategy for sure a couple of years ago, right? Where a lot of collectors would get free airdrops, but obviously you have to pay to airdrop it, right? Because you're paying yeah. the gas to airdrop it. And if there's no secondary royalties, does the airdrop strategy change a little bit? Is it more of a gift for active community members? Like what's your thoughts on how you would do that? Yeah, for me, I I treat it as like a gift for the people that are most active or like my biggest collectors or, you know, people that have just supported or helped me. Um, but yeah, it's definitely airdrops cost money. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've, I feel very lucky people have really supported me. So I, I want to give back as well. Very cool. Okay. Let's talk about art blocks a little bit. I'm going to be getting Snowfro on the show, but I'm curious, like, what do artists need to know about what art blocks is and how it works and all that fun stuff? Yeah. So art blocks was created by Snowfro. Um, I think in 2019 or 2020, he'll, I'm sure he'll elaborate, but it was, uh, you know, it is a generative art platform that is, for me, it's kind of like the institutional status, like museum quality, gener generative art, and it's all code-based projects. Um, so you you kind of create create an idea, create a project, and then you present it to the art blocks board and you know they'll say yes or they'll say no and if they say yes um i i was accepted into curated and that was um late 2021 what is that what is curated uh the curated art blocks collection was i think they stopped doing curated at like eight i think i was in one of the last ones but it was they would drop, I'm pretty sure once a month, a curated collection. And they they just chose like their favorite generative art projects from all the submissions. So to get in curated was um, a little more, you know, difficult because you had to present your idea to a board and they had to approve it or not. So. I'm just curious though, um What's the upside to art blocks beyond the prestige? Are they actually actively marketing to their community on your behalf? Are they providing tech support? I'm just curious, like what makes it unique that an artist would want to work with them versus just doing it on their own? Yeah, um, they do. They do do a bit of, you know, marketing, like when your drop happens on social media, um, but they have like a very active discord and there's a lot of support in there all the artists get their own channels and um yeah there's there's kind of just a lot more eyes than doing it individually because a lot of people follow art blocks and are just you know waiting to see what the next project is when you work with art blocks is there typically some sort of arrangement where in exchange for these benefits there's going to be some sort of a percentage that's going to go to art blocks yeah, I think during during mint, um, I think our block takes two point five percent, and oh, then it's not they. Much. Yeah. No, I'm pretty. Don't. I mean that's, me that's that. yeah, but I mean that's that's much lower than I would have expected. You know what I mean? That that seems pretty yeah. unreasonable. Maybe it's five yeah. percent. I forget. This was almost two years ago, but um, it's still pretty small. I mean, like in the grand yeah. scheme of things, right? Because I would imagine if you were to work with a 
gallery, aren't they going to take a much bigger chunk of it typically? Yeah, galleries usually take about 50% of the artist sales. So Yeah. So um awesome. Okay. So now are you is everything you're doing on art blocks or is there just some stuff that's on art blocks? Once you're in, you're in. How does that work? Um, the collection I dropped on art blocks is called the Vortex Collection, and that was that's my only project that I have on art blocks, but some um, some artists, they have multiple projects on it. I just happen to have one and then I have projects elsewhere, but you know, they're all, they're all on the blockchain. So they're, they're Very out cool. there. <laughs> so your, uh, your digital paint NFT project, is that done? Are you, have you closed the mint on that or is it still active as of today? It's actually, it's still active. Yeah. So why don't you talk a little bit about some of the cool functionalities that you put in there? Like, um, talk about the interactivity and all that fun stuff just so people can kind of, even though we're not, we have to describe it in words. We're not going to have any visuals on the screen here, but maybe you can kind of okay. describe what's unique about it. Yeah, that that project, it's at digitalpaint.io. And the cool part of it, of it is you can make your own NFT. You can, like, there's a lot of kids that love, you know, collectors, kids that love to play with it. It's it's pretty cool. Anybody can just go and experience it. And it's all, we created, it's all coded and we created different brushes that you can choose in the toolbar, different shapes. And with each brush is a different um, musical instrument or sound. So you can kind of create your own, your own painted musical masterpiece and um, choose from a lot of different colors and swatches. And then, yeah, when you, when you mint it and on certain dates, the, the brushes will change and have like nice little Easter eggs in it and the sounds will change. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that part because it kind of just goes on and lives forever and is just stays dynamic. So that sounds really complicated. Were you, you must have partnered with somebody, right? To be able to pull some of this stuff off. Like any recommendations on who, who you worked with, what, how it works. If anybody wants to do something super creative like that. Yeah. For that project, um, I, um, worked with cut mod and chainsaw and yeah, we, it took us probably about a year to, from. Wow. It, and it was inspired by uh, an interactive room that I created with CutMod like a year and a half, a year before that, where you could go up to a wall, there was a projection on it, and you could kind of paint in different, the different um, colors and sounds would just come out. Um, so it was a really fun, interactive, but physical installation. So that was inspired by that. And yeah, I would say... If, if you're thinking about doing a project or a collaboration with someone, just um, do it with someone you're inspired by. Definitely ask around. If you find someone you think would be a good fit, ask around and, you know, vet them, make sure they're, they've treated others well. And yeah. So is CutMod and Chainsaw, is that one company or is CutMod one and Chainsaw? That's two different companies. Yeah. So CutMod so does the interactive interactive installation type stuff and then chainsaw coded the the project got it and then any wisdom on how when you partner with someone how that typically works is that like an upfront payment is it a shared um in in the mint or how does that typically work what's the what's the kind of the standard these days yeah usually the standard is um during the mint um you'll you know just divvy up certain percentages but, you know, I, I know people that have just paid people outright as like, this is the fee. I don't know how much this project is going to make, but um, I like to do it in percentages because it kind of incentivizes people to put a, put more effort and, you know, get, market it a little bit more. So. so digital paint is not minted out yet. And sometimes people freak out if they don't mint out on a first day or the first week or whatever, right? How long has digital yeah. paint been out for and how long will it remain open for? I'm just curious yeah. what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, it's, you know, the market is very 
strange right now. It's it's gotten pretty pretty slow. So I I mean I really believe in the project and I love it. Um, but yeah, it's you know people shouldn't freak out if their project doesn't mint out on the first day. It doesn't mean it you know is not a beautiful project. But yeah, I. Is it okay to keep say, it open indefinitely? I mean, is that what some people do? They just, there's this many and it's. I think not. they do, but my goal is we'll, we'll cap it at a certain amount. And, you know, that's, that's the ideal that you'll just close the collection and whatever's minted out. That's, that's the cap. Well, and I would imagine that if you had a goal of 5,000 and I don't know how many are left, but let's just say half of them are sold, that's kind of technically valuable to let everyone know you're going to be closing the collection. There's going to be less yeah. because now all of a sudden there's fewer of these things available on the market, right? Like Chromey Squiggles, what do they have? 5,000 or something like that? I can't remember how many, maybe they have 10,000, but I would okay. imagine the, the, the lower the number, potentially the better it is for the investors that got in earlier because that means there's less supply, right? Yeah, exactly. It kind of makes their investment more, more valuable, makes the artwork, um, a lot less of them. So, yeah. So, Jen, if people want to see your art, um, where do they go? And if they also want to connect with you on the socials, do you have a preferred place that you want to send them to? Yeah, I would say go to my website, jenstark.com. If you are on Instagram, it's at jenstark, Twitter, jen underscore stark. So, I'm on all the social media platforms. Look me up. I'm pretty active. So, yeah. Thank you, Ben, so much for coming on the show and answering all my questions. Really appreciate it. Of course. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.